Uh, but we're going to be looking together at Proverbs uh, 24, and we'll be looking at verses 19 through 22. Proverbs uh, 24, beginning in verse 19, where, God words, where God's word reads as follows. Fret not yourself because of evildoers, and be not envious of the wicked, for the evil man has no future. The lamp of the wicked will be put out. My son, fear the Lord and the King, and do not join with those who do otherwise, for a disaster will arise suddenly from them, and who knows the ruin that will come from them both. So far, the reading from God's word this morning, may he add its blessing to our hearts. Please be seated. It's not often that there is a public event that is so significant that it requires us to pause and look at God's Word together to ensure that we are responding in godliness. And uh, as the news came in from the events that took place yesterday evening, uh, I was convicted that this is such an event. We were at the supper table together, and, and the news came in that uh, former President Trump had been, been shot at 6.15 p.m., shot in the ear, one bystander dead, another wounded, the shooter himself killed, and the former president whisked away by secret service. How does the Christian respond to that kind of event? Well, there are many ways that the Christian could respond. For example, the response might be that Trump is made into a saint. Now we have to think about that because there's really nothing different about the man Donald Trump between the day before yesterday and yesterday. The only difference about this man is that somebody tried to kill him and they, they failed. He is still just a man with his strengths and weaknesses. And so we're not pausing so that we can work through issues about a preferred or despised politician. Our aim this morning isn't to exalt a man but rather to think together about how the Christian should respond, to think about what it means to live as a Christian in a world that is dominated by evil, in a world where such an event is possible. We could also turn and demonize political opponents. I would discourage you as a Christian from engaging in social media for your guiding rails into how to handle this situation. Trump's political opponents have expressed their sympathies and the response of Donald Trump's supporters often has been profanity-laced tirades which ac accuse them specifically and personally of causing this problem. But just as the point is not to exalt Donald Trump, so also our aim this morning isn't to blame his opponents. The point in some sense is to make sure that our emotional response to an event that we experience as a, as a country would be in check that our emotions would be ordered biblically. We could also, as Christians, become overwhelmed by fear. There have many, been many public pronouncements about what happened yesterday. Celebrities have weighed in with horror and dismay. Foreign dignitaries have extended their sympathies our own president has taken to the television to condemn the violence. 
And the tenor of all of those messages is that our country is in deep trouble. Now, how does the Christian respond to that sentiment? However, however true it might be, how does the Christian respond to that sentiment? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is to remember that any nation where God is not worshipped is by, by default in deep trouble. How does a blessing come to a nation? Psalm 33 verse 12 tells us, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. That is not the United States of America. We have in God we trust on our currency. But we deny it in our entertainment, in our political discourse, in our business practices, in our cultural communication. And we're not really here even to sort out how we can fix the United States of America. I think we should all recognize that it's probably beyond our ability to do that. But we have come to the Word of God to see how the Christian should live in a nation that is steeped in sin. Now, the answer isn't going to be found in news reports or in our own personal feelings about the matter, our personal opinions about the matter, which probably will vary and differ. The answer is to be found in God's Word. Psalm 119, verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So as is often the case, the book of Proverbs shines its light so that we would know how we should walk. It gives us the light on our path. So our aim this morning is not to solve political problems. It's not even to make commentary on sociological issues. Our aim this morning must be to ground ourselves in God's Word in light of our current national unrest. And as we approach God's Word in that way, the book of Proverbs teaches us that in the face of the evildoer, Enduring the activities of the wicked one, the Christian is to fear the Lord and be at peace. So in the face of the evildoer, living under the activity of the wicked one, the Christian is to fear the Lord and to be at peace. And from this text, we're going to learn two things. First, we're going to learn what we should not do in verse 19 and 20. And then in verse 21 and 22, we're going to learn what we should do. So what we should not do, what we should do. This text begins with the negative. It begins with what we should not do. So we look at the attempt on Donald Trump's life, and perhaps our conclusion is that this is the natural outcome. This is what happens when you ratchet up political discourse to such a level that, that it is simply inflaming hatred from one side to another. And from that, we may conclude that this is a problem that's unique to 2024. This is a problem that's unique to former President Trump and the, the way that he pushes people's buttons, whether that's a legitimate criticism or not. But we have to remember that assassination of political figures is not a novel political enterprise whether internationally or in our own country. In our own country, six other presidents have been shot. Four of them have died as a result of their wounds. Abraham Lincoln, John F. Kennedy, Kennedy James Garfield, and William McKinley. Two of them have survived, Theodore Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan. There have been other presidents who have faced attempts on their lives, but no shots were fired. They, they were incompetent before they even got to that point. 
But it is good to notice that from the 1860s to the 1980s, political figures in our nation have experienced assassination attempts. It is not unique to our time. And it is also not unique to our place. Uh, Think about in all the places of the world, throughout all history, the many accounts that you can think about where a political figure is, uh, there's an attempt on his life. The ones that come to my mind, there's only a few that you can mention, but in 44 BC, Julius Caesar murdered in the Senate of Rome. Uh, there uh, There is also... Uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, I just listened to a series of podcasts on him. His assassination was, was the, the event that, that launched the world into the Great War, the First World War. In my own childhood, I was 10 years old, but I still remember it, the, the reports coming of the president of Egypt, Anwar Sadat, murdered uh, as he was reviewing his troops, a military coup where The soldiers got out of the truck and emptied their automatic weapons into the presidential box, killing uh, this man. So it is a mistake to think that this moment is unique in world history, or even that it is unique to the history of our nation. As Christians, we should be stabilized, we should be anchored by what God says in His Word in Ecclesiastes 1 Verse 9, what has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. So in that assassinations have been attempted across time, across cultures, and they will continue to be used as a tool to gain control. Why is that? because we live in a sinful world. And man in his nature is consumed with all sorts of evil. That's the record of Scripture. The Bible lays out the path. The the Bible lays out how it is that we are where we are today. And And it describes the fall of man into sin where God says to Adam and Eve, you shall not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And man, in his pride and arrogance, rebels against God, wants to be God, and eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and God has told him what will happen. In the day that you eat of it, you will surely die, and man does die. His body begins to decay, and his soul is immediately corrupted. The nature of man changes from from one that is able to do what is good to one that is only bent on evil all the time. And from that sinful nature, from that evil nature, flow all of his sinful actions. And the Bible doesn't waste any time to show how that works itself out in humanity. After the fall into sin, the next chapter, Genesis 4, Cain is murdering his brother Abel. Why? because Abel's sacrifice is preferred over his own. Not too long after that, the same chapter, Lamech is described as murdering anybody who would affront his honor. And as the stories of Scripture go on, you're faced with atrocity after atrocity, maybe culminating most poignantly or most graphically or gruesomely in the account of how the men of Gibeah defile the concubine of the Levites. But the stories go on and on and on. And the Bible's assessment of man is that he is bent on evil all the time. And one of the things that the Bible points out as the consequence of a nature that is bent on evil is recorded for us in uh, Romans 3, in verse 15, where it talks about man as being swift to shed blood. We have witnessed Men who are swift to shed blood, acting on their own nature. It is natural for a man to do the thing that we have witnessed and heard about yesterday. So as Christians, we should not expect a world 
untarnished by sin. But it is also good for us to consider that sin and the effects of sin are, are not just things that are out there. The effects of sin are seen in our own hearts. They are seen in our own families. They are seen in our homes. Surely, surely we must recognize that sin is all around us. Surely we must recognize it in the sinful deeds that we see people committing. The things that we have to ask for forgiveness for. There will be men who hate their fellow man, who lust for fame, notoriety, whose lust for power means that they stop at no evil deed. And they will carry out their wicked plans. And this text says, teaches us first, what the Christian is not to do. And Solomon's divinely inspired wisdom is to be our guide. And it says there's two things that we should not do as Christians when it comes to what we've witnessed. First, it says in verse 9 that we're to fret not. And second, verse 19, it says we're to fret not. And secondly, in verse 19, it says we are not to be envious. We're not to fret. To fret, another word for fretting is worrying. And worrying, fretting, is really an expression of a lack of trust. It's really an expression of a fearfulness over something that we cannot control. And so parents fret about the, ch the choices that their children make, whether they're small or, or grown. It doesn't seem to matter. Because they're anxious that the child, they don't trust that the child will choose rightly. Maybe a more trite example is that uh, people worry, they're, they fret about the weather forecast because they're unable to control the storms. And in this case, we may fret or be anxious or worry about the power of wicked people. But here in verse 19, it says to us, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Are you fretting because of evildoers this morning? When you listen to the news, do you fret what, over what may happen to the church because there are evildoers in this world? Has the assassination attempt on Donald Trump made you anxious, made you worry? Verse 19 says, fret not yourself because of evildoers. It's not unique to the book of Proverbs. There's a Psalm, Psalm 37, begins the same way, where David sings, Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. In Matthew 6 and verse 34, our Lord Jesus Christ assures us in the same way. He says, do not be anxious about tomorrow. You see, for the Christian... Fear over circumstances is not the right response. Why? Not because we're stronger people. Fear is not the right response because of the God who we worship. Fret not. Fear not. Why? Because God rules and reigns in the heavens. The second thing this text tells us not to do is not to be envious. Envy is a form of covetousness. Uh, we can covet the, the wicked. It's telling us here that we're not to, but that means that there is a temptation to exactly do that. So we look at the wicked and they're successful. And we say to ourselves, I wish I was successful. And we look at the wicked, and he enjoys riches. 
And we say to ourselves, I wish I was rich. And the wicked is healthy and strong. And we say to ourselves, I wish I was healthy and strong. And the Christian is foolishly tempted to imitate wicked ways. But Romans 6 and verse 23 reminds us, tells us, the wages of sin is what? It's death. That's the only thing you can expect when you live in the world of sin. So what is the Christian's spiritual response to the wicked? It is not envy. It is pity. And what is the Christian's civic response to the wicked? It is not envy, but it is justice. So why the call to cease from fretting, to cease from envying? Well, it is explained for us in this text, in in verse 20. It says, the evil man has no future. The lamp of the wicked will be put out. I wonder if we remember that today. I wonder if we remember that evildoers and wicked men will not always affect us. There will be a time when you will never again hear the report of someone seeking to take another man's life. Forget about presidents or, or, or politicians or famous people. You won't hear about anybody seeking to take another man's life. Why is that? Because all men will pass away. The evil man has no future. The lamp of the wicked will be put out. What's the... What's the metaphor? Why the lamp of the wicked will be put out? What does that mean? It means that the wicked man will die. He will go from seeing light to only darkness. The evildoer may be strong today, but his future is like any other man. And the wicked man may be successful the way that we measure success, but his lamp will be put out. Now, Christian, when you look at this fallen world, what do you have that the evildoer will never have? What do you have that the wicked will never have? You have a future resurrection of glory. You have the promise of, of an eternal inheritance in a city which is so glorious that the streets are paved with gold. It's a construction material. The most precious metal on our planet is asphalt in the New Jerusalem. That is what is awaiting the Christian. You will be, you are a co-heir with Christ. Instead of darkness, you will have an eternity bathed in light. Uh, The book of Revelation describes the restoration that God will effect in this world. It's the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven. And in this new Jerusalem, the Apostle John records that the sun and moon will not be necessary. They will not be needed because God will be the light of that city. Revelation 21 and verse 23, it says that city has no need of sun and moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and its lamp is the lamb. So in light of yesterday's events, the Christian must not fret, and the Christian must not respond to envy. Why? Because of the truth of 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in this world. When we fret, 
when we worry, we are failing to rest in that truth. When we envy, we reject that truth. Do not forget who you worship. That's essentially what the book of Proverbs is saying. Don't be anxious and don't be envious because you worship the living God. So we should not fret and we should not envy. What are the things that we should do? It says in verse 21, my son, fear the Lord and the king. We are to fear the Lord. That is the Christian response to any circumstance, also an unsettling circumstance like we have experienced in our nation yesterday. We are not to fret over it. We're not to envy the wicked. That would be to fear man. The Christian is not to fear man, but he is to fear the Lord. Now, what does that mean, to fear the Lord? Does it mean to cower before the Lord God in terror because you dread his presence? Is it to be like Adam in the garden when he hears the Lord walking in the garden after he has fallen in sin and he hears the Lord God and his first instinct is to hide himself from God because he fears him? Is that what this text is calling us to do? It is not. And we can tell from other ways that the book of Proverbs tells us uh, to fear the Lord. In Proverbs 8 and verse 13, it says, The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. In Proverbs 9 and verse 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In Proverbs 10, verse 27, it says, The fear of the Lord prolongs life. Proverbs 14 and verse 27, it says, The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. And then in Proverbs 19 and verse 23, it says, The fear of the Lord leads to life, and whoever has it rests satisfied. The fear of the Lord is the Christian life. It is living your life in relationship with a God who is pure and who has redeemed you. That is the fear of the Lord. It is the reverence and awe that the redeemed feel towards the God who is not there to condemn them, but the God who has promised and secured their salvation. Fear of the Lord, it's a phrase that shows the changed life of a man who is under God's protection. This man who has the fear of the Lord, he, he turns away from evil. The fear of the Lord makes him wise. It prolongs his life. It causes him to rest. That is the way that the man who is in Christ because of the grace of God responds to him. He loves the Lord. He loves his law. He hates what is opposed to him. So the Christian doesn't fear man. He, he fears the Lord. And that's what we're called to do in the face of senseless uh, political violence. The fear of the Lord in us means we do not fear the evildoer. But it doesn't mean that we're indifferent to him. The Christian doesn't shrug at evil, but he condemns it. He seeks biblical justice because he hates evil. Exactly because he fears the Lord. He's not indifferent about who is his ruler. But he seeks to gain a ruler who governs in that same fear of the Lord. Why? Because he wants the good of his nation. Again, Psalm 33, 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. 
And in our text, we see that a righteous king, verse 22, we, we, we don't have a king, our, a righteous ruler in our nation behaves in the same way as the Lord does. In verse uh, 22, it is talked in verse 21 about the Lord and the king. Well, in verse 22, it talks about how ruin will come from both on those who do not fear the Lord and the king. The Lord and the king together will bring disaster and ruin on the one who doesn't fear the Lord. Now, that is pure biblical justice. And God will always render that. And the king should always render that. Moments like these should not make us disheartened. There is a, a warning for those who do not fear God. And we, by God's grace, will not endure the thing to which that warning points. Not because we are by nature right, but because God, by His grace, has made us right. He has transferred our citizenship from the countries of this world to the heavenly kingdom. And so we are called, as we are called to fear the Lord and the King, we are called to seek after a ruler who looks for heaven's laws on earth. And because we are not to fret and because we are not to envy, and exactly because we are to fear the Lord, and because we are to fear the King, as Christians, we should not fret over this moment. It doesn't mean you detach yourself from it. It doesn't mean you don't feel outrage over it. It doesn't mean you pretend that it didn't happen. But it does mean that you live in this nation in light of your heavenly citizenship. There are events in this life that make us fret. Do you remember today that you belong to a heavenly king? Do you remember today that you have been adopted into his family? Do you remember today that that He has promised you that He will never leave you or forsake you? And do you remember today that there is nothing in all of creation that can separate you from His love? When the Lord Jesus Christ departed from this world, He encouraged His disciples with a promise that he was going to prepare a place for them. To indicate to them that, that this world is not their home. That there is a heavenly inheritance that they are waiting for. And that, that same promise applies to you if you are in him. That as you live in this world, you're not living in your permanent home. You're a sojourner passing through with the expectation of a heavenly inheritance. So moments like an attempted assassination can tempt you to become disheartened. And you have to ask yourself, am I anxious today? And if I am anxious over a political circumstance, why is that so? To put a not too fine a point on it, you have to ask yourself, what part of God's promise am I not believing today? If you are anxious, return to the Lord. Trust in Him to deliver you. Don't fret and don't envy. That's the call to the Christian. We are also called <clears throat> to fear the Lord 
and to fear the Lord only. We fear the Lord because he is sovereign over all moments, including the one that happened yesterday. Nothing has happened that has not been ordained by him. Now, the evildoer, he thinks that he is furthering his own plan, and the Lord mocks him and laughs at him because he is using the evildoer's own sin to accomplish his perfect will. Think about the Jews in Jerusalem or Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate thought he was advancing his political career by hanging this Jewish carpenter on a cross. That's a sinful act, to condemn an innocent man to death for personal, uh, personal advancement. And yet it is that very act that the Lord used to, to accomplish the, the redemption that he had promised. Now, do we see God's aim in what happened yesterday? I expect we don't. I expect we don't understand all that God is orchestrating through this event. Do, do we know why God allowed this evildoer to do evil? I expect not. But the point is not even to start asking why God would ordain such a thing. As soon as you ask that question, you are doubting that God is good. The point is that our God is good and he is merciful and compassionate and he did ordain it. And he has every right to do so. It is in trusting in him in these moments that peace is found. Not in questioning him, but in trusting him that peace is found. No man can give you peace. No man should be able to take away your peace. God gives you peace. It is in the fear of the Lord, it says in our text, or in, uh, in Proverbs uh, 19.23. It is in the fear of the Lord that man's, man rests satisfied. So we are also then to look to the Lord for our future. We've seen in this text that the evildoer has no future. Why is that? Because the evildoer assuredly, certainly, will be condemned. His sins will find him out. Books will be opened. If he's not found out in this life, he will stand before the judgment seat of God and, and books will be open and his heart, his thoughts will be laid bare and his transgressions against God's law will be declared and he will be sentenced. That is dismal and it is the state of the world. The godless evildoer the wicked who seems so powerful that that appearance lasts only for a moment. But if you are in Christ, that the squabbles of this earth are not to be compared to the glory that you will have in heaven, the glory to which you are already joined, the, the glory that has been guaranteed for you by the blood of Christ. Jesus Christ, your mediator. Jesus Christ, your, your savior. He is, he is king on the throne. And he is judging the nations. He is, he is ruling over the nations. And you as a Christian will participate in these things. How? Because you are united to the anointed one. Because you are united, you are united to Christ. You are, you are purchased by him. You are protected by him. You are never abandoned by him. You are exalted because of him. He has purchased for you, Christian, 
a future at the cost of his own blood. And that is your only hope. Would you like a nation where the righteous prosper? I hope you would. Would you like a nation where the evildoer is punished? We should want that. But what do you do when God in his providence denies you these things? That's the question that we're facing today. It's not dealing with what we may want in an ideal setting. It's what do you do living in the corruption of this world? Whenever this world discourages us or worries us, we are to look away from this world and look to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to remember Him and His work. We're to remember we're not to fear the plotting and scheming of man. We're not to envy him. We're not to be anxious about him. We're to fear the Lord. We're to live under the authorities that he has set in place. And we're to do that with integrity and serve the Lord in this world. An assassination attempt can be unsettling because it's an evidence of the corruption of man also on display in our own country. And not a single person here in this room can control it. But that does not mean that we now fret, worry over those who do evil. It does not mean that we envy the wicked. We fear the Lord. We seek His glory. We hate evil. We love wisdom, and we rest satisfied in Him. Why? Not because we expect that this life will be easy, or even because we expect that this life will be safe. We do this because it is the Lord who gives eternal peace to all who look to Him in Christ. I want to close our time together this morning by reading from Psalm 146. I'll read the entirety of the psalm. It says there, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together.